Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Business of Possibility podcast with Ulster University Business School. I'm Wendy Austin. In this series, we're diving deep into the world of business in Northern Ireland. We're looking at how they're staying afloat in the current climate and how even, or perhaps particularly during a global pandemic, businesses are innovating and demonstrating their real entrepreneurial spirit. This episode, Skills, will look at adapting skills in a changing environment and the profound impact that the pandemic has had on the whole skills system, jobs and future work as well. We'll offer an insight into the critical skills and capabilities needed to aid business continuity and economic recovery here in Northern Ireland. A great cast for today's podcast. Uh, we have Jackie Henry, Senior Partner at Deloitte and Ulster University Visiting Professor. Hi, Jackie. Hello, Wendy. We have Professor Gillian Armstrong, Director of Business Engagement at Ulster University Business School. Hi, Gillian. Hello. Hello, Wendy. And all the way from California, Manisa Amini, who's CEO and founder of Marvel Marketers. Hi, Manisa. Hi, Wendy. Great to have you with us today. Now, we've lots to talk about, um, as we've been hearing. Uh, the whole skills climate really has been transformed by what's been happening in the last six months or thereabouts. Who can believe it's that long? Um, Jackie, maybe you could start off just by, it's nice to get to know one another. If you could tell us a bit about yourself, about what you do and about how the last six months have been. Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks, Wendy. So as you said in the intro, I'm senior partner for Deloitte here in Northern Ireland. I'm also in Deloitte, the UK's People and Purpose Lead. So that um, brings me responsibility for 1,000 people here in Belfast and then in the UK, 5,000, over 5,000, actually about 5,500 across our consulting business. So it has been a really busy and challenging time. Um, it's not the year I expected to have or to have to lead through. So from way back in, in early March to have all of those people within 24 hours land into lockdown, and we did it, through to then um, in the last months, really looking after our people, putting our people at the center of our response. And of course then serving our clients alongside that and, and serving them really well. It's been really challenging and really busy. I bet it has indeed. Gillian, what about the academic uh, university environment and, and yourself? How, is it, how has that been? Yeah, well, um, I manage a, a business engagement unit. So very much in that unit, um, we're all about um, staying close to business and finding out what the needs are, that we can translate some of those needs back into the business school to ensure that we're relevant. Um, for us in that type of function, we've had to do things very differently to ensure that we are still engaging with business. Uh, but right across the business school, um, certainly we, we've had a, a challenging six months. Um, I would say that, that now that um, we, we actually have got on very well, but we, we did have a, a very quick turnaround in terms of uh, moving to remote working, moving to online learning solutions for students and clients. Um, and yes, you know, I, I think between staff and stakeholders, we, we've managed to do things very well and keeping students at the heart of it, um, that their learning experience was um, impacted as little as possible. Um, so, you know, looking back, no, I think there have been some interesting um, insights have come out of it as well. Excellent. Manisa, what about you? Uh, how have things been for you and for your company? You know, we, our world is digital. So what it did for us in the last six months, I mean, all of 2020 is whatever we were doing, it just put an incredible acceleration. Um, and that's not just with our clients, because we were already working on projects that fall just became more urgent. So like Jackie mentioned, we've been quite busy. We, I have also seen an increased demand on the softer side of business, the people side. And that's not just for my employees, but even our clients, for example. So we have been trying to get as creative as we can to infuse some of the softer sides of like compassion and understanding all the while while we're working with some of the largest organizations in the world on their digital transformation. I, I have found that in general, um, you know, people are quite impressive. Uh, 
agility is our middle name, and that's been very useful to us. Uh, but but you know, nobody has been immune, certainly, from the disruption of 2020. That's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, looking at the whole skills landscape, the pandemic has obviously transformed how we work and learn and communicate, and it would seem it's, that that's going to continue. It's not going to go away at all. Jackie, what would you, you say are the key skills that have really come to the fore in adapting to this new environment and responding to the challenge? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I suppose looking back, back getting everybody into lockdown was really the easy bit actually and um, but really supporting our people to work effectively to serve their clients and to do that really well that has been that's been the big challenge and of course like many of our people as as is the case across the globe have been trying to do that in really challenging home circumstances be it with you know kids hanging about or caring responsibilities or just you know the fear and the anxiety that COVID had brought. Um, so uh, as you said, Manisa, I mean, the first thing I'd say is that it was an incredible accelerator for us. Um, we have been talking for a long time with some great research in Deloitte about the future of work, about the impact of that in skills. Our human capital trend report, you know, is much read and commented on. And the things in that actually within our own business, then we accelerated really quickly. And we're really fortunate to have that sort of culture and agile ways of working that meant we could do that um, like for instance I remember back in February I signed myself up for a zoom pilot I had never heard of zoom back in February seems so bizarre given my life is now one big seeing I don't know 10 12 hour zoom day um, but at that point in terms of skills really um, you know having that ability you know and that tech fluency and being tech savvy ability to really get familiar with tools you know the video conferences the zooms the teams the collaboration platforms cloud sharing of documents and then use that in your day-to-day -day working but as well I think it's really interesting how we've brought it into our life as well you know I was at a zoom black tie the other week which was actually quite fabulous. Who would have thought? You know, I really would never have thought. So I think embracing technology has been so massively important. Um, and I'd say as well, it's really shifted, I guess. Um, you know, before in Deloitte, we had always a proportion of our people who were working remotely, but never 100% of our people. And um, But now it is all of our people. So actually, you know, pulling skills and tech fluency and that continuous exploration of these tools through all of our people and, as you said, across our clients as well has been massively important. Gillian, what would you say have been the key skills that have come to the fore? I thought it was really interesting what Manisa mentioned there about yeah. the soft skills. And actually, I was reading something about how mm. that is one of the most important elements of the Dutch education system, that they believe that you will learn the soft skills and that other ones then kind of come with your job or whatever it is that you're doing. But, but I wonder what your view is on, of the skills that have come to the fore. Well, you know, communication, always important. Probably in the last few months, it has been critical. Um, for us, particularly around team working. Um, and I would say that for a lot of teams, um, you think you know staff and you know, think you know teams, but probably in the last few months, we've got to know teams even more um, through different scenarios. So I think that dynamic team working um, that's supported by really good communication um, and maybe um, some different types of communication depending on what suits that team. Uh, but also I'd say for us, it's that agility piece. Um, and it's, it's maybe taking that leap of confidence where um, maybe up until this year, there would have been a lot of consideration and thought and, um, you know, will we make that decision to do that? Probably the last few months, there hasn't been that time. We've had to make the leap of faith in a few uh, different scenarios. Um, but actually, if it happens in a supportive way, um, culturally, um, that, that can be very um, beneficial. That I'd say there's a learning piece as well. Um, and it's just sharing that information, keeping lines of communication open. Um, thinks, you know, that there have been some issues, uh, learning from them, um, and moving on to the next um, activity as well. Uh, but uh, I, I'd say we will, I, I think for most organizations, 
um, a, a lot of teamwork in, will come out of it a little bit stronger. Manisha, what would so? you say about the, those key skills that have come to the fore? And maybe as well about the companies that have had to tap into a whole new skill set uh, and maybe take a sort of the sort of leap that they've been thinking about but haven't quite got round to. Yeah, so I, I mean, too bad this is only a 40 minute podcast. So the, the, the first is that, you know, we were very lucky because we adopted a decentralized model from inception. So we had zero transition to a remote model. Uh, if anything, this was the year we were actually setting up a few offices in, in Belfast and, you know, we have a small office in Austin. So we got really lucky and we kind of stayed quiet. So, you know, letting everyone else take the time to adjust. The skill that got real important really fast, though, is creative problem solving, which always seems obvious, particularly in consulting, but creative problem solving, again, on the soft side of things. And I'll give you a small example. I mean, it's no longer optional not to be tech savvy. Uh, my nephew, who's five, has to now learn how to mute and unmute himself in kindergarten. You know, when those are the expectations against a five-year-old, we're in high tech. The expectations of the fluency with technology, as Jackie mentioned, and other things are a, a, a given, a deal breaker. In terms of, um, and then in terms of creative problem solving, I'll give you something we've done at Marvel, which I think is such a fun win, and I encourage everyone to do it. I realized that everyone was really stressed out. It's just the pressures of pandemic. And so we started a fitness challenge. And I started it and I went and I recorded myself doing some kind of physical activity and I tagged my COO, then he tagged the, you know, the manager of TSS and, and it's been just fantastic and like you guys said you learn so much about people we learn who lives on a farm we learn who lives by the water we learn who's you know what the hiking looks like in different areas of the world in terms of your question about the client side again in many ways we're lucky it just turned it just revved up we went from first gear to fifth gear we were already working with clients on digital transformation we had several emergency projects where you can imagine how much of an organization's budget is against live events, Dreamforce, you know, um, it, just the big event, how much of their budget, we're in Silicon Valley, at least uh, I'm in Silicon Valley, the rest of my team is everywhere. You can imagine how much money was pegged for, you know, not six feet distance between each other. So we had to work extremely fast with a lot of clients and it wasn't like, let's think about it. It was like, move fast, no thinking, right? How do you take the budget minimize your costs, pivot and create an experience, acknowledging it is not a one-for-one -one trade. I cannot replicate a one-hour meeting with someone with a one-hour Zoom call. You kind of have to come to terms with that. So you have to think through, well, what do I need to pivot or change in order to create a same level of engagement and personalization, have the win and still, you know, pull it all off while under quarantine. So what trends then are we seeing? I mean, you're a perfectly placed to, to know about this money. So, you know, if you look at the whole business of the use of digital tools and technologies, which, as all of you have said, has accelerated at an enormous pace for everyone in, in all organisations. Um, what trends are we seeing and how do you think, Manisa, that's going to be impacting people and the workplace in future? I mean, we almost don't have time to think about the future because almost immediately there's one dominant trend. The dominant trend is how do you take your live event and how do, you, how do you still get the same revenue you were getting, acquire the same net new names, build relationships personalized and scale, but how do you do it with digital systems and tools? Which prior was a, a channel, but it was that channel plus a live event channel plus everything else. And now it is the dominant channel. So that is the first immediate um, kind of pivot all organizations are doing as fast as they can. Longer term, I think there's a bit of, and I'll be honest with you, I think this is a little short-sighted of leadership in a lot of companies. There's a little bit of a like, how long can we wait to see if things turn back? And some people are waiting too long, in my opinion. They're just waiting too long. It's not, we've all discussed it, it's not going to come back to the normalcy that was there before. So some people are resistant, and that resistance I'm seeing is going to have ramifications in the long run. It, they are going to fall a little bit behind, but, you know, we're here to help. But um, I do see that in the longer term, things that were optional will just not be optional. You, you cannot say, I prefer in person. 
I'm trying to figure out how do I still, you know, meet with C-suite when I can't meet with C-suite. Yeah, I'm really good in person, guys. You know, Zoom is nice, but I'm good in person. So I have to as well sit and think through these problem statements. Um, and, you know, some of the creative things like the black, eye, black tie event, I, we haven't tried that yet, are great. I really think there has to be a, something net new that shows up. I haven't figured it out yet. If anyone does, share it with me. But I don't think it's going to be, oh, either we're having, you know, these highly personalized relationships or we're going to do everything over Zoom. I don't think that's going to have the impact. So I think long term, the whole industry has to solve that problem. Jackie, have you come across any of that desperate clinging on to the past? Maybe <laughs> I can put it a bit <laughs> dramatically, but you know, there there are always going to be people like you who are going to, going to want to move forwards. But we all have worked uh, at various times with with those who were reluctant to take a take a new step. I mean, are you still coming across that, or is everybody converted now? Do you know, I think there is there's there's variance in the pace, but I think you know certainly a lot of the clients that I'm working with are taking this opportunity to ask some hard questions and just have a look at um, business strategy. We have done that too in Deloitte. We've spent a few, a few weeks of this time just making sure we're in right position, right shape. We've got the right North Star sense of direction where we're going and that we've got, we're, we're in optimum shape behind that. But clients are increasingly um, asking us um, to help them through and taking a good look at as I've said, their strategy and um, and I guess um, whether their proposition, whether their offer, is um, is 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 what the market will buy. How the market might buy it to go into Manisha's point, you know, the channels that are available or not available, and actually whether there's some new offers that they can bring through. And this, there are opportunities, um, and um, and I think um, and again, when I'm working that through into into I guess. The processes and the people side as well. I mean, it has, if I'm honest, it's led to some, you know, some really hard decisions for organisations, hasn't it? And we see the outworkings of that, and um, and some really hard um, issues which are impacting people. Um, but actually, you know, the businesses that are will come through are those that are agile. We'll take this as an opportunity just to do that, to take stock, to do it quickly, to move up pace and shift direction um, where they need. So I see quite a bit of it, Wendy, um, which hopefully is heartening. Yeah. Yeah. Gillian, what do you think the skills landscape in Northern Ireland looks like at the moment? I mean, what are the big challenges that you've seen? Um, goodness, I, I suppose, you know, in the last few months, you know, I, I do think that whole upskilling, reskilling area, you know, very much is, has moved in terms of priorities. And I think government have been, you know, very quick to, to see that and support that. Um, now, a lot of the educational providers within the region, you know, have got behind that push um, to see what we can do at the moment for those impacted by COVID. Um, I would say going forward, we are going to get much more of that. Um, and in some ways, um, as much as we are in challenging circumstances, um, there are some opportunities there as well for businesses and individuals to actually look at, well, you know, what skills do I need at the moment now and going forward? Um, and trying to, to look at all opportunities and again, taking this leap of faith uh, because there, there's huge variety there, um, some very well thought through solutions. And I think all providers have been incredibly responsible on that. I mean, and, uh, you know, it's a, a unique of, opportunity. A uh, unique opportunity. There was a lot of talk uh, in the last eighteen months or so about the fact that, um, you know, in twenty years' time, so many of the jobs were going to be jobs that currently didn't exist. Now we had no idea that we were going to have the the six months that we've just had. But um, yeah. boy, does COVID underline. That that is the case when he said, you know, it's uh, there are going to be jobs that didn't exist. There are going to be, sadly, it seems, a lot of jobs that did exist that no longer do. Yeah, I mean, we certainly. It, it almost seems kind of polar, right? In some industries, it's made everyone super busy, and in other industries, it's vanished, just in thin air. What What's interesting is, pandemic or not, there was a skills gap. There was already a digital skills gap. That's one of the reasons why we, you know, we went into Europe, we built partnerships with Ulster, it was to bridge this, 
ahead of time. So we thought before it becomes even more urgent, we will work to bridge that skill gap, you know, um, help educate, thought leadership, training. And, and now the, the skill gap just got bigger. And so I really feel like, um, I, think the, I think the good news is, is in many ways this will help because it will not be a, is it for us conversation, right? And sometimes that does deter progress and it does, you know, it, it, it puts the onus of the right decision on specific circumstances, which might be myopic in some sense. Now I feel like, no one is going to question it. And so there, as, as Jillian said, there will be more support, more buy-in, more partnerships, more kind of everyone partnering on the same path because it's everyone's problem. And, and frankly, this is, there's like literally labor shortages in some areas right now when you've got millions of people without jobs. That sounds like the, the right kind of problem to want to solve. Um, and yeah, the yeah. ability to solve it is, is, we're very lucky to have that as well. Jackie, I could see you nodding there when Manisa was talking. I mean, well, what impact do you see this having on the jobs of the future? Yeah, um, well, well, it's huge. But, you know, as, as we've all said there, you know, it's, it's here right now. And, and actually it was here before. It's just accelerated and made clear. I think that point, Manisa, is a great point. Um, absolutely. So, and I think to go back to Gillian, what you said, actually, um, I think what will help us here in Northern Ireland is, you know, that early collaboration, the models we'd set in place, you know, yeah. with Ulster, with other providers across education, skills academies, you know, we're pretty agile actually in how then we were starting to really support the reskill, the retraining agenda, you know, the academies in um, cyber, robotics, automation, cloud, you know, they're great examples, you know, we can stand those up like that, you know, many organisations are availing of those, um, including our own, we have done incredibly well through those partnerships and collaborating over the last years, so I think we've got a really good underpinning infrastructure to support how we might flex and change and adapt that as, as we go. And that model is the envy of many others. I mean, I know across the Deloitte network, you know, our Deloitte um, Portuguese colleagues, they've replicated it. Um, Middle East, they've, they've, they've done that too. So it is a great model. And, um, and it really is thanks to the partners across um, government and education who have backed that. But you're right, we don't know what the jobs are. I mean, I was reading this week, you know, some of, there was a great article on some of the titles you know that are in recruitment popping up you know your your chief well-being and people officer through to you know all sorts of architects digital architect any type of architect you know and um but we don't know so at the absolute core of that we must continue to support people and particularly the young people and this is going to be a hard few years for young people coming through and the people who are impacted by those hard decisions i meant i mentioned who are going to be dislocated or made redundant through this process to try, you know, to, to, to seize the moment, to adapt, to, to, you know, be flexible, to reskill, retrain, and put on a great offer there that will really help them and pull them through this. Because actually, again, at the core of a great opportunity here um, in terms of the centres of excellence that we have established in cyber and blockchain. So um, we need to stay focused on that use the foundations we've already built in terms of how we can reskill, retrain and develop those soft skills in people and do that very quickly and up here. But you've all mentioned the, uh, the, the tie up now between Marvel Marketers and Ulster University Business School. And I wonder, Manisa, could you tell us a bit more about that, about the positive action that's being taken through that to address the digital skills gap in Northern Ireland? Yeah, absolutely. So that, again, was pre-pandemic. We already knew there was a skills gap. We knew that, you know, the farther you go in the time zone to the right from where I sit, the, there's a little bit of a lag in the digital market, a little bit of a lag, mostly because Silicon Valley is right here. So we were preparing for ourselves, believe it or not. We were saying, okay, we want to make sure we have a really good labor market there because we saw the impact of a labor shortage here. It is not pretty. It's not pretty. So we were like, okay, well, there's so many smart people. There's great institutions. There's a thirst for the knowledge. Let's go and prepare the labor market for ourselves. So we started basically imagine a high touch nurture where we were like, we were going to take the academics, the, the students, that we were going to take the future labor market and over time prepare them to work for us and to work for our clients. That was the strategy, real transparently. 
And then, you know, the pandemic hit and everything again just became that much more relevant and urgent. So we um, basically, it's, it's not focused around any particular platform or tool. The idea is how do you talk to someone who's either interested in digital that might not have the opportunity just given the landscape there or someone who we think is a good fit or someone in the right major, whatever the right indicators are, how do you, how do you let them know what they don't know right now? Because sometimes that's the problem. By the time someone discovers this amazing industry that's a great fit for them, they've spent many years. And so that's, that's the effort that we've been making to try to really help um, pivot the, it, and it was about pace, right? We were just trying to make it faster. And, and now all of it's just, you know, more of the same, uh, more, more topics, faster agility. I, I, there's one thing I did want to comment on. I think absolutely there needs to be additional work done in the field of, so how are you still successful, not in person? Because not everyone knows how to do that, uh, just frankly. No one, not everyone knows how to do that. And in some places it like backfires. So I do think that a whole industry is going to pop up or should pop up helping folks learn how to still be successful in a different model. And I'll stop there because I think I can go on forever. Sounds like another business opportunity for you, Manisa. Yeah, so put it on the list. <laughs> Gillian, how has this all gone down with your students? You were looking at the, the role of higher education. How is Ulster University yeah. Business School responding to those yeah. demands? I mean, w one of the things I thought that was really interesting in, was in the press release uh, about the original boot camps and so on that, that you'd been doing with your students. I think it was Oliver who said, you know, whenever he started doing this, um, I hadn't a clue, um, but he really enjoyed the fact that he was actually doing it himself uh, and that he said it was so much better than YouTube because it, it, was, uh, it was involving him in a proper way. Tell us about how it's gone down. Um, I, I suppose we have been fortunate, you know, in that staff and students, um, you know, w would have been using a virtual learning environment w within their courses. Um, whether it's full-time, part-time, organisational development. Um, and I suppose if you look at that as a continuum, you know, COVID has really accelerated that. So I suppose we, we have the foundations there. Having said that, um, you know, there was um, some very rapid um, learning and training going on, I think, with staff and students in terms of what exactly the technology could do for us. Um, we've been quite fortunate in that the provider and technology we have has high level functionality that we had lots of capability there that maybe we hadn't used fully until we'd had to. Um, so I think that did help. Uh, but also I think it has allowed us to look at some more personalized learning strategies. So for some, maybe it's an organizational development type program. Um, maybe for some of those students, the flexibility in an online solution has been welcomed in that in a very challenging environment, they've had a little bit more flexibility to still maintain that learning. Um, so I think it's a case that no one solution suits you know, all different student groups. I think that the answer on this has been to tailor solutions to the different markets um, and to really listen and respond um, so, you know, it's, and I think our students as well, in one way, have developed really effective remote learning skills that they will bring to um, the new world of work. And they will be very savvy on different technologies. And what do you think business education will look like in 2021? And, and what will be shaping that? I think for us very much, you know, it, Jackie knows this um, firsthand, but I, I think for us, it's, it will always be around partnership and that um, constantly listening, sensing and responding and being agile and flexible. Um, that yes, we have core learning outcomes, but um, you know, how we develop programs and how we uh, enhance learning on an ongoing basis, it's that constant listening, review, changing, adapting, and I think the speed of that will probably accelerate, but I think that the foundations are there already. Jackie? 
Um, no, absolutely. I'd build, you know, exactly that point. You know, those are the key, absolutely the key, key skills and key to the future. I think, you know, if you look at it from an organisational point of view, it is about, you know, it is that underpin of, you know, great um, tech fluency in people. It's um, strong tech adopters, you know, people who can adopt and adapt really easily. Um, partnerships, collaboration, and then for businesses, we, we really need to see um, I guess people who have those qualities are curious, creative, and, and we talked about communication. And the other thing I'd pull out actually, and just looking forward to, to what sort of skills we need, is um, the, the resilience point. You know, I think we, we haven't maybe mentioned that um, much so far, but um, I think lockdown has really shone a light again on the importance of resilience. And, um, you know, in particular, you know, the ability to manage stress. It's been a tough time for everyone. Um, emotional intelligence and, and just those attributes of, as well of having a really positive mindset. Um, and I think those are massive differentiators. So finding those people, working in partnership with Ulster and others um, to develop um, our young people and people of all generations in a reskill retraining, um, I think that will be key to our future success. And I think we may well come back to resilience in, in, in a future podcast, actually, too. Um, Manisa, what skills do you feel businesses are going to need now in a post-COVID-19 world? And how important is fulfilling those skills gaps, which, as you rightly said, we, we all knew existed before this happened? Um, how important is fulfilling those gaps uh, to the future of all of our industries? If it wasn't a deal breaker before, it's a, now a deal breaker. So um, I would echo 100% both what Jillian said and Jackie, and I was actually going to really, um, you know, the hard skills are the easiest things to train someone on. I can teach someone how to use a market automation tool quite easily. Those key things you listed, Jackie, have, are, are what make the difference. You know, the positive mindset, the agility, the resilience, the ability to you know, take ownership of your own success, the ability to not wait for someone else to teach you how to be, you know, a successful remote employee, the ability to say, okay, what do I need to do different now that I cannot be in front of my client? Those things, there's like a whole list of those questions. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult to train some of these skills. It's not like training someone how to use a tool. So in, again, in my opinion, there's a whole industry waiting to happen where they teach that, that softer side. And before, pan, before pandemic, in, in my day, before pandemic, you know, we were struggling with, you, you can have the smartest, most amazing, intelligent, tech savvy consultant, you take them from behind the computer and you put them in a presentation live and you see those skills start to deteriorate. You, you just, they just kind of fall apart because they're so used to a certain way. Similarly, you take an, a person who's used to being successful live, and now you put them behind a screen, you start to see skills deteriorate. It, it, people's comfort with being on video. We've had to like, you know, talk to people that, you know, please turn on your video, please turn on your video, please be prepared. You know, uh, they, you know, teaching folks that remote work is not on-demand work. It's not, you know, it's not flex time. It's it's like work, but in a different model. So, and this is just, you know, with the younger folks, obviously, because transition is hard um, and they get it and they get it fast. But those are the skills that I think when we think what are the business skills that will make, that will make material impact in the success of an individual in their career or in the success of an organization. Everybody knows an organization is as successful as the people. The hard skills are easy. I, I, can, I can manage that. It's the soft skills, everything Jackie listed, that will be the, the make or break. That's, what's gonna, that's when you're going to be able to tell what is a great organization and what is a pretty good organization. That, that will be the, the differentiator. Gillian, what would you say as we all enter this new phase, hopefully, of recovery? Um, what steps can businesses be taking now? to ensure that they're meeting future work pipelines? What should they be doing? Yeah, I think in some ways, you know, that there's a great piece at the moment, I think um, Deloitte have out on, on super learning, I, I thought was a very interesting one about, in some ways this could be a, an opportune time for, for more learning, um, to really look at, you know, where those needs are, where the opportunities are, 
um, to try and maybe, you know, maybe accelerate some of that, um, to really um, look at partnering, maybe it's with us in the business school, to actually start that dialogue in terms of, you know, what is possible, um, you know, what can happen with that joined up working, but actually to take that this could be a great time to actually look at that whole upskilling piece um, that, that maybe, you know, in another couple of years that we are actually, as a region, that we really have the skills in place that we do need. Um, so that there are opportunities there. Jackie, what are you saying to your colleagues and indeed to your clients about the steps mm -hmm. that, that they can be taking to ensure they're going to meet those future work pipelines? Yeah, well, I think the starting point um, is um, to use the disruption of COVID to um, check strategy, their market offer, their proposition, does it fit? Um, and then from that, then that will then feed into the answer on um, their, their skills, what skills they need, and how then they best support their people in this time. And Gillian's point, right, um, point is right. Um, use this time now to do that and then to, um, to upskill, to develop your learning culture in your organization. You know, we all need really to drive that continuous learning culture where people are learning, loving to learn, continuing to learn and, and can do that easily. Um, Partnering is a great way to, to, to try and move off with that if, if you need some help. And, um, and as well, so invest in skills and well-being. I think those are the big differentiators, I think, alongside just doing that check in on strategy and making sure you've got um, the right focus and the right offer to market. And, and then, and possibly as well, taking some hard decisions as well. Manisa, what about you? So, you know, I have a very long consulting background, so I, of course, give multi-pronged answers. But the first is the short run and the long run. Short run, the advice is very clear. Make sure you pivot as fast as possible with whatever is necessary to maximize your output and mitigate, and mitigate your losses this year, which goes back to, you know, take your live events, how do we as fast as possible, make sure we pivot digitally. That's no one has, no one's going to disagree on that. The second part is some of what Jackie said, which is um, you need to reset a little bit and step back and say, okay, come to terms. You know, I, I think a lot of people are not coming to terms. Come to terms with the fact that we have a new normal. You are going to be leading a different kind of company potentially as a leader, right? You are going to um, have, you have a different audience. You have folks that um, are all been in quarantine. Your consumers are now different. So you have to kind of come to terms with that. And then ask the questions of, so what do I do different to still achieve the goal that I need? So really stepping back after the noise is finished, stepping back and saying, how do I now sell to a different type of consumer? How do I sell to a different kind of company, right? The, the companies are all different now. And I don't think people are doing that. I think, again, I mentioned earlier, there's a little bit of hesitation. You know, I encourage all leaders, lead boldly, lead, lead with courage. This is not the time. This is not for the weak of heart right now. We need to get going. Um, so, so some of that, a lot of that kind of stuff. Totally fascinating, I must say, short term or long term. Um, thanks all of you so much uh, for joining me for today's podcast to Jackie, Gillian and Manisa. Um, adapting skills in a changing environment uh, and boy, do we seem to be getting on with it at the moment. Uh, it's been fascinating hearing about what's been happening and thank you for listening and indeed for watching if that's what you've been doing. Um, I'm Wendy Austin. This has been the Business of Possibility podcast with Ulster University Business School. Make sure now that you subscribe to the series wherever you get your podcasts and keep an eye on Ulster University Business School's social media channels for updates each week. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter as well at Wendy Talks Biz with two Z's or Z's, depending on where you come from. Thanks for watching and listening. Have a good day.